So we will finalize the problem we discussed last class, and we were working with this RLC circuit. Um, so we developed the equation, and now I, I created this PDF that is in Canvas now. So you, you can check this. So these are the, 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 the model we got, this one right here, with the system matrix. We calculate the eigenvalues, and then after getting the eigenvalues, we got the eigenvectors here. By using the singularity equation here, we got the eigenvector that is going to be complex. We got these four parameters. We got four equations. Two of them are linearly independent. We pick this last two, and we got a relationship for A and B in terms of C and D. So if we pick C equal to one and D equal to zero, then A and B is determined. By doing that, we got these eigenvectors. For lambda two, that is uh, the conjugate of lambda one, then we got Q2, which is another typo here. Um, Q2 is equal to Q1 conjugate. Um, so by, by putting Q1 and Q2 in the matrix Q, Q1, Q2, we got the inverse. So the inverse is one over the determinant multiplied by the transpose of the cofactor of Q, which is by a two by two matrix. Basically, we exchange this coefficient. One goes here and this goes here. And we multiply by negative one this term, negative one here. That's the inverse. With that, we got the the initial condition for our transform system, which is Q inverse x zero, and we did this in the whiteboard, but we made a, I made a mistake. So the result is this one. What we got in the whiteboard was positive one over two. So here we will get negative j multiplied by negative j, that's positive j squared, that's negative one. So that sign was wrong in our uh, development in the whiteboard. So this is negative. And with that, uh, we have the initial condition, and we got the solution for y1 and y2. And then we use the transformation qy vector y to get the vector x. So we did that, and this is what we obtained. So we were working with the state variable x2, and we need to prove here that all the imaginary term get canceled. So we were working with that. And then we made another mistake there. Um, so we got all these equations all the way to here. So in that part, um, we, can, we can factorize by two over square root of three. And then you have here negative one over two. And then you have here square root of three over two. And the issue we were having, um, that is, that's this one. Camera. So the equation for x2 is going to be uh, negative 2 over square root of 3 exponential of negative t factor of square root of 3 over 2 cosine of this negative 1 over 2 sine of this. Let me check. Uh, Yes. Okay. So that's that's what we have, and until there, we're fine. So what we're going to do here to combine this, we're going to propose that this term is cosine of theta, and this term is sine of theta. So when you see this number, you see sine of theta one half and cosine of theta the square root of three over two. You immediately think about 
30 or sometimes you you will not remember well you might say it's 60 and somebody said 60 I picked 60 here we did it but that was a mistake uh, so how do you realize which one it, it is so you get the unit circle here this is the real axis this is the imaginary axis so in the real axis, we will have cosine of theta. And you can see here, cosine of theta is greater than half. And sine of theta is exactly half. So to do that, if this is one here and this is half, um, then this is going to be cosine of theta. So this cosine of theta is going to be a square root of three over two. And this is 0 0.5, which is one over half. So by looking at this, you remember now that this is going to be 30 degrees. So 30 degrees uh, or is going to be pi over six radians. So the solution for this is theta is pi over six radians. So we replace that there and we should get the solution. So let me go back to the slide here. One and I need to change the camera. Yeah, so we have that. Uh, so we made that uh, proposal here and we solve it. Now we determine that theta is pi over six. And finally, we get that x2 is this function. As you can see, it's a real quantity. So the other thing we did in class last uh, Friday, we said, well, let's do it in MATLAB. And we solve this by numerical calculation. So we have the parameters here. We created the matrix A. Then we were, we're going to use this command EIG to determine Q, the matrix Q we are defining with Q1 and Q2, the matrix lambda, capital lambda, which is diagonal, each diagonal term corresponds to each of the eigenvalues. We have the initial condition here. We calculate the initial condition of the transform system. We, create, we created a vector here for time, which is going to be between zero second and 10 seconds uh, by by just writing this, this will create 100 points equally spaced between 0 and 10. So this is going to be, typically, it's going to be a row vector. By using the apostrophe, it's going to be a column vector t. Now, for each value of t, then we will calculate what is the value for y1 and y2 using our expression, which is the initial condition exponential of lambda 1 t, and for the other is going to be lambda 2 t. We calculated numerically y1 and y2. They, by, by using the transformation, then we get the vector for x1 and x2 at that particular time. The first component of that vector is going to be x1, and we will store it here. k is the index of time. So for each time, we will fill in this vector the value of x1. For x2, the same thing, but here is going to be the second component of this vector. By finishing that for loop, we have a solution for x1 and x2. To compare, then, we're going to calculate x2 using the analytical expression we got, which is here. So we will store here x2 calculated because we're going to use exponential of a column vector here, and we're going to get the cosine of a column vector here, you're multiplying two column vectors. But what you want to do is an element by element multiplication. That's why we're going to use here, before the multiplication symbol, we're going to put a period there. With that, we will tell MATLAB this is an element by element multiplication. And in this vector, then, we will have an x2 calculated. We will do the plotting. We plot t x1 in blue, t x2 in red, with a line width of 1.5. We plot it. 
we will use the command hold on. So we can plot again without erasing this plot, hold on. So we will plot again the calculated value of X2, but this time it's going to be with segmented black line. And then we will put the label for the horizontal axis, label for the vertical axis, and the legend. So X1 and X2 calculated numerically, and X2 calculated analytically. And that's what we did. Um, this should be the, the solution. There it is. Now we got it right. Yeah. So any question? Is that clear? You're working on a homework now, which basically you need to follow the same step. You will get the system transformed, get Ys, whatever the order in the system is, you will get all the Ys, and then we will transform it back to this in original state variable. Yeah? Question? No? So what you're going to remember from this part, well, get the solution, but we need to remember when we get this, by looking at the, at the eigenvalues alone, we get the mode, which is the exponential of the eigenvalue t. And the mode will show you one way that the system can behave dynamically. It's a form of dynamic behavior. So if you see a mode that has a complex eigenvalue, that mode will show you that the system, one way to behave is with oscillation. So a system that doesn't have eigenvalues that are complex will not oscillate, right? If you have eigenvalues that are real, you will just see exponential growth or exponential decay. The other thing, when you calculate these eigenvalues, either they are complex or real, if the real part of the eigenvalue is negative, we're fine, the system is stable. But if one of them has a positive, real part, the system will blow up and the system will be unstable. Okay. Now we move to the next chapter. Now that we have a, an understanding of, of linear system, now we, we will try to understand how we can apply this to nonlinear system. But the first thing we need to discuss is what is the difference? Okay, then the name says something, you know, one is linear and one is nonlinear. So what can you tell me? Well, how we can identify when you have a nonlinear system? The most simple way. A nonlinear system, the variable is dependent on itself. Uh, Over here. Yep. Um, if you increase, uh, say, like your input signal by a certain amount, you expect a, a particular slope to come out of it. You know, increase by one, uh, you know, the slope is two. The two out of it will follow a particular linear form for uh, for all linear okay. signals, and nonlinear signals do not follow that. Form. Good. Do you have something that can complement that? A comment. Do you agree with what the student said? Do you agree? Something else? So basically, what we're dealing with is with the rate of change of the state variables, whether the rate of change is going to be a linear combination of the state variables or not. In this case, for the linear system, the rate of change, the derivative, of all the state variables is going to be a linear combination of the state variables itself. That is the case of a linear system. And the behavior can be calculated analytically. We, we show we can get the solution mathematically without the need of a computer. We know what is the solution. So if we deviate from that, then we will deal with a nonlinear system. How we're going to deviate? Well, it depends on the system. It depends on the components we have in the system. If you have inductors, capacitors, and resistors in an electrical circuit, 
or you will deal with a linear system. But you, we need to add some other components there that can behave in a different fashion. Then we will face a nonlinear system. Some difference of linear nonlinear system with respect to linear system. The first one, and we're going to review that in this chapter, we're going to deal with potentially multiple equilibrium points. In a linear system with no excitation, what is the equilibrium point? X dot equal A X. What is the equilibrium point? No, um... Zero, the region. So X one to all the way to a fan are all zero. And there is just one equilibrium point, that one, yeah? So in a nonlinear system, we might have more than that one. We will have multiple. How many? Well, it depends on the system. Another big difference, you may have sustained bounded oscillation and never ever reach an equilibrium point. Can you have something like this in a linear system? Oscillation that can be re remain there in the system forever, never goes away. Can we? Theoretically speaking, can we? What will lead to oscillation in a linear system? No energy dissipation. So if we don't have any energy dissipation in a linear system, you might have this behavior, theoretically speaking. So when LC circuit, then they, you will have an exchange of energy between the two components forever. In a practical setting, that's impossible because you will have some dissipation. You don't have a resistor with zero resistance, right? A, a, a wire without any resistance, you don't have that. But in a nonlinear system, no matter what is the dissipation you have, you might have sustained oscillation there and will not go away. That's a big difference. We will call this limit cycle. We will not study this here in this course, but you might have this behavior, peri periodic oscillation called limit cycle. This is the name, limit cycle. Another difference, in an unstable system, state variables may diverge to infinity in finite time. So in, you, you have the system and at some finite time, let's say 10 seconds, the system will blow up. In a linear system, you will not have that behavior because the, system, the variables will blow up uh, with a certain rate and go to infinite. So when the variables will be infinite in infinite time, but uh, nonlinear system can be faster than that. And the other may exhibit chaotic behavior. Have you ever seen a chaotic behavior? Have you, what? Uh, like a fire flickering? I mean, or are you talking about specifically like- A problem, in no, no, in general. Oh, and it's, yeah, like uh, fire is pretty chaotic, it's a pretty complex system. Yeah, yeah, that's one. Why do you think it's so chaotic? Because, uh, uh, like, well, for example, a campfire, there's just many different ways that, for example, uh, air can come in to combust. Yeah. Uh, the sticks that are being burned, whatever's being burned, is usually not a very clean arrangement. It depends on multiple factors, yeah. very complex. And hard to model, and then it's hard to predict what will happen. Yeah. Another one you have seen, and, and we will deal with a pendulum here, which is not chaotic. But if you put another, another uh, arm here with another weight, you will have a double pendulum. And that is chaotic. You start from an initial point and will start oscillating, but at some point it will start doing very crazy things. You know, in linear system, we don't have chaotic behavior. So those are the things we will be prone to have potentially. The power system is nonlinear. So we might have to deal with this at, at some point. A uh, typical thing we will deal with, multiple equilibrium points. The system will have multiple equilibrium points. 
Yes. So, uh, transmission lines, as far as we've seen, are modeled with inductors, capacitors, and resistors. So, what would be the nonlinear component? They will come in the dynamic component, generators, for example. Oh, okay. And then you will have some controllers and you will have some loads. Typically, for the loads, we assume that they consume some fixed amount of power, but that is a assumption, it's a poor model for some consumptions in the load. Sometimes they behave in a nonlinear fashion. Uh, so in the power system, we will have to deal with this most of the time. So we will get there. In, in the most simple case, we will find two equilibrium points for a single machine. We will talk about it. And then uh, we might exceed this limit cycle, sustained oscillation, but I'm not sure with the system that we have, we will ever see something like that. Um, that's it. That's it. Uh, this part probably for, for the system we will study in this course, we're not going to discuss this half. So what we're going to discuss during this chapter, multiple equilibrium point, we're going to try to apply the linear and uh, the understanding we have of linear system, how that can be applied to nonlinear system. So we will use this linearization and eigenvalues to try to understand what is the nonlinear behavior of the system. And then the last part, we're going to try to sketch a phase portrait of a nonlinear system. What is a phase portrait? It shows the relation of the state variables in the phase plane. Starting from different initial points. Conditions to the yeah, so we, we saw, for example, for a stable focus, what is the phase for trade for a stable focus? Spiral, if this is stable, the spiral will converge to the equilibrium point. So how we can use that to sketch what would be the phase for trade of a nonlinear system? So these are the main part we will study in this chapter. The first thing uh, we will need to discuss what is the equilibrium point. So the equilibrium point uh, of the system, first of all, the system is going to be represented now in this fashion. This is what we said before, a linear system, the, the, the rate of change in time of each of the state variables is going to be proportional to the state variables. You have a matrix A multiplied by the vector of the state variable. Now these are nonlinear, so the relationship is going to be nonlinear. How are we going to describe that? By using nonlinear function for each of one of the derivatives. So the derivative for the state variables will correspond to some nonlinear function that will involve some or all of the state variables. Okay? And we will have an initial condition too. So we will start from a given level of story energy. And we want to see how the state variables will change in time starting from that point. So how we're going to determine the equilibrium point. An equilibrium point is a point in the state space to, that do not change in time. So the changes with respect to time need to be equal to zero. So basically, if we force that, we're going to find the values for x1, x2, all the way to xn that will make each one of these derivatives equal to zero. So that's what we are trying to find. If we're able to find those points, then we will say we found an equilibrium. How can you solve this? Have you seen this before? Where? Have you dealt in the past with the solution of simultaneous set of uh, equation? In the iterative method. Yeah, like what? Like Gauss, Gauss method or Newton Rasmussen. Do you remember that? Where did you study that recently? Four twenty one. How do you apply it? You have to have what kind of equation did you solve that were equal to zero? Power flow equation. What kind of equation? Power. Power where injected in the vases. 
So the active power injected in bus one equal to zero. The reactive power injected in bus one equal to zero. You have a PQ as in bus one. Okay, let's solve that. What do you need to solve for all the variables? Which are the variables? Voltage, magnitude, and voltage angle of the bus, right? So you did this. How do you solve it? Newton wraps, right? The same thing can we do here. Uh, you would have a set of nonlinear equations that you need to find the values of x and make sure that all these functions are equal to zero. We can apply Newton wraps. What do you need to do to apply Newton wraps? We use the Taylor series expansion of this nonlinear equation around a specific point, right? And then you by, by using the Taylor series expansion, then you get the evaluation of the function around a specific point plus the derivative of the function multiplied by the correction delta x plus one over two, the second derivative of the function multiplied by delta x squared, do you remember? But newton raphson will just take into account the first linear term. We'll ignore all the terms second order and higher. Uh, well, an example. So you have a system, two state variable, x1 and x2, f1 and f2. f1 is linear here, uh, but f2 is nonlinear. So this is a nonlinear system. How we found the, find the equilibrium point? We make x1 equal to zero, and that means x2 needs to be equal to now we make x2 equal to zero. As x2 is equal to zero, then these two terms need to be equal to zero. And that's what we have here. So x2 is equal to zero. This term needs to be equal to zero, but this vanish is zero. We can factorize by x1 here, and you get x1 factor of negative one plus one over 64, x1 to the sixth. That's equal to zero. As we have x1 as a factor, then one solution for x1 is zero. And the other solution, because this is x1 to the six, you have two solutions, positive or, or negative, which in this case is, is going to be plus minus two. So those are the three equilibrium points that we will have for this system. So all of them will consider x2 equal to zero. But x1 in one moment will take the value of zero. So that's going to be your first equilibrium point. The second one is when x1 is two, another equilibrium point. And third point is when x1 is equal to negative two. So you have three equilibrium points for this system. So as I said, uh, there are two ways to deal with this. One conceptual understanding of nonlinear system, and the other the actual solution of nonlinear system. For the actual solution, we will use numerical solution, and we will use the technique in chapter two. We will apply these numerical integration techniques to get the solution for this nonlinear system. But at this point, what I want to discuss with you is how we can get an understanding of this nonlinear system without solving the system. Just try to get an idea. And how we can get an idea is to see what happened in the system around the equilibrium point. So if you have an equilibrium point that is a stable or unstable, we can you know, anticipate how would be the behavior around the equilibrium point. So what are the typical modes that we study and we know already? We will see around a equilibrium point whether the system will oscillate or not, right? So what, what needs to happen if we assume that the system around the equilibrium point is well represented by a linear model and the eigenvalue of that linear model are complex, then the system will oscillate, right? The other thing we will do, we will, get this linear model in that equilibrium point if the real part of the eigenvalues for that linear model are positive, 
system will be unstable. So we will start using all this concept from linear system and apply it to nonlinear system around the equilibrium. How well is going to be this linear model? It will represent the system well enough or not? Well, that depends on the system. It depends what is the size of the neighborhood that this linear model will be a good representation or not. We don't know, we, we don't have a, a general rule for that. It will depend from system to system. But if you get very close to the equilibrium point, this linear representation will be very accurate and will tell you how the system should behave. Yeah. So what we're going to do then, we will pick the equilibrium point, which one? We, we have three equilibrium points in this system. Let's pick one. One of those, doesn't matter which one. So for each of the state variable here, I have the general case here, but for each of the state variables, then we will apply the Taylor series expansion. So if the function of the derivative evaluated in your equilibrium point plus the first derivative multiplied by the correction of the state variable uh, for each one of the state variable plus all the other higher order terms you have quadratic cubic and so on for the second equation you will have something similar the function evaluated in the equilibrium point and the derivative multiplied by the correction of the first state variable, second, all the way to the last one, plus the higher order terms in the last equation, of course. So what we're going to do here, we're, we're uh, proposing that the system can be represented by a linear uh, model, then we're going to neglect these higher order terms. If these delta x are sufficiently small, then this linearization will be a good approximation of the behavior of uh, the system around those equilibrium points. So we will neglect this. And if we do that, then we can come up with this linear representation. Uh, in this model here, as you, as you can see in the equation here, what we have here is x1 dot. But at x1 dot, there. x1 dot is going to be. the derivative of x1 in time. So this will be the same if instead of getting the derivative of x1, I get the derivative of x1 plus or minus a constant term. We use a constant term as the equilibrium point of x1. This is a constant term. Because this is constant, the derivative of this in time is zero. So this is exactly an equality with this term. So in this here is nothing else than the derivative of delta x1 in time. So delta x1 is x1 minus x1 at the equilibrium point. So if, as, as I said before, if this distance, if x1 do not deviate significantly from the equilibrium point, this will be suffici sufficiently small and the linear representation will be accurate. Yeah. So that's the definition that we have here. And this will be true for all the state variables. So for x2, again, this is equal to delta x2 that and all the way to the last state variable. So with that, then we can 
take each one of the equations and put it in matrix form. We pick the first equation and we put it in the first row in this matrix equation. Second equation, second row. Last equation, last row. Basically, what we obtain now is a linear representation of the system around the equilibrium point x1, xie. And now we can study the matrix. We can, this derivative now, all of them are going to be evaluated at the equilibrium point. So these are going to be uh, coefficients that we, we will determine in advance. And then we can calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix to describe how the equilibrium point will be. So using the previous system, here is the system, then uh, we have three equilibrium points, as I said before, and we can verify how the linear representation will be. Uh, as you can see here, x1, which is equal to delta x1 dot, x1 dot equal to this, is going to be nothing else than delta x2. So the first row in our linear representation is going to be 0, 1, because this is equal to delta x2, the derivative of that. The derivative of this function f1 uh, with respect to x2 is 1. So 1 multiplied by delta x2 will lead to this equation. The second term will be here is going to be the derivative of f2 with respect to x1 multiplied by delta x1. So this derived with, with, with uh, respect to x1, you have negative 1 here, and then you have 7 over 64 x1 to the 6, which is this term. So that term multiplied by delta x1 and the second coefficient here is going to be the derivative with respect to x2 of f2, which is negative 1 multiplied by delta x2, which is right. So this is the matrix, the general matrix for the system, the linearized system around each one of the equilibrium points. The difference is how this matrix will look when we're at the different equilibrium points. In this case, point one, x1 is zero. So the matrix becomes zero, one, negative, one, negative, one. So we can calculate the eigenvalues of this by solving the characteristic equation. And we get that the eigenvalues are complex. And the real part of the eigenvalues are negative. So these correspond to a stable focus. So the real if we are close to the region, the system will be stable. The state variables will remain there around the, will converge to the equilibrium point to zero. Now we check what happened at point two. The matrix is the same. What is the difference now that X1 at the equilibrium point two is not zero, but two. We replace that value there and we get this matrix now, 0, 1, 6, negative 1. We calculate the eigenvalues and we obtain that this is a subtle norm. Is this a stable or not? No, because you have a positive real eigenvalue. It's a subtle null point. So if for some reason the system gets close to the equilibrium point, we have the risk that the system might lose stability. How the system will lose the stability? Because the state variable will diverge to infinity in one direction. We don't know which direction yet. And we're trying to get that uh, very clear. We're trying to apply all our knowledge of linear system to understand how the system would behave. But so far, we have three equilibrium points. Zero, zero is a stable focus. If we're close to that point, the system will remain and converge to that uh, equilibrium point. But if we move to this point, let's say the state variables increase or we start far away from zero, zero, 
the state variable might be affected by this and some trajectory will push us to an infinite. So very risky to get close to point two. What happened to point three? This is point three, the same thing, because this is x1 to the six, negative two, which is that's the value for x1, will lead to the same matrix, therefore the same eigenvalues, and this is a subtle node as well. So do you get the picture here? How many equilibrium points do we have? Let me go back here. So X2 is zero. The three equilibrium point, uh, they have a X2 equal to zero. And for X1, one is at the origin, X2 equal to zero, X1 equal to zero, that's one point. And this is a stable focus. Then you have two, zero, another equilibrium point. This is a subtle node. And then we have negative two, zero, another subtle node. Because this is a stable and you have complex eigenvalues here, uh, if you are close to the equilibrium point and the state variables are there for some reason, you know that the system will converge in that fashion, right? But if this is start from far away here, do you expect that this will converge all the time there? No. Because you are going to get close to the action or what happened dynamically around this equilibrium point, and this is a subtle node. Some trajectories here will take you to that subtle node, but some of them will take you to infinite, and that's a problem. The system might lose the stability. So there is a region here in which the system can operate safely, and the system will always remain stable. But if these regions start growing at some point, the, the, because of what happened on, on, in the system around this equilibrium point, you have lines that will push you to infinity. The system might lose stability if, if you start exploring the system in a larger region. Uh, that's what we can say with the eigenvalues so far. So how we can deal with this situation. Well, one thing we can do, we can solve for the solution numerically, and we will get there in chapter four. But at this point, we were able to get an idea of what would happen in the system. And we, by looking at the eigenvalues in the equilibrium point, we understand there will be a safe region here. If the system operated around the equilibrium point in that region, the system will remain stable. If this start growing, we have the risk that the system might be unstable at some point. We can verify this by using what the Wolfram Alpha. Have you heard of Wolfram Alpha? On it right now. Yeah, yeah. And we can use the face portrait, and they have a nice command that we can use. And that command is the stream density plot. So in this stream density plot, you will use a square bracket here, and, and you will separate the inputs by comma. You will have a curly bracket here, the first one. That's nothing else in the first curly bracket. You will have F1 here, comma, F2. This is the derivative of X1. This is the derivative of X2. Second curly bracket, you have a comma here, second curly bracket, you put the range of x1. Where do you want to plot this? Well, when x1 goes from negative 5 to 5. And the last one is going to be x2 from negative 5 to 5 as well. You just type that there in the website, press enter. You should be able to get the face portrait. 
And this is the face portrait of that system. And what we got before gave us already an idea of this. If you get close to the equilibrium point, you see that the system will be stable. If you remain close enough, you can guarantee that the system always be, will be stable. We can call some region here the region of attraction, meaning if you start there, the system is starting in that region, it will always converge to the equilibrium point and you guarantee stability. But if you start moving away from there, you will have the forces of these two subtle nodes. And some of those forces will take you to infinity. You can see this is a subtle node because if you get very close enough, you can see the eigen value around the equilibrium point, right? And one of them, one of the eigen values is stable. Where is the other eigen value here? Well, I can see it over there somehow. Are you following me? Two direction. Which eigen value, eigen vector is this one? Related to the stable or an unstable eigen value. Look at the figure. This one. The other one is right here, an eigenvector. You get very close to that equilibrium point and you have an eigenvector right here. Is that related to the stable or an stable eigenvalue? The first one's unstable. This one, unstable, why? Because the trajectory is- Because the trajectory the will leave from the equilibrium point and push you away from there. So this is an unstable one, this one, stable one, and you go there and the trajectory will take you to the equilibrium point. But when you get closer there, you will see the, 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 that you're being pushed away from there because you have the other eigenvalue that is unstable, right? On this side, something similar. You have an eigenvector somewhere here, which is going to be the stable one, and another one that is going to be somewhere here that is the unstable one. So as you can see, uh, if you remain in this area somehow, you will be stable. Even if you start far away from here, if you start from this point, you go through the eigenvector that is stable, related to this equilibrium point, eigenvalue that is stable, but real or negative. But as soon as you get closer, you are being pushed away through in the direction of the unstable eigenvalue. But when you move away, you are trapped by the stable focus here and the system converges to the equilibrium point. You're fine. But if you start a little bit to the left here, you don't have the same luck. And the system will move through the red curve as you see here and you will diverge to infinity. Yeah. All right, any question? So this is what is coming. Uh, we will play with nonlinear system. We will apply a uh, linearization, a values, and we will try to anticipate the behavior of the system. What, what we're going to study next is the pendulum. And the pendulum is a very nice system because a synchronous machine do not behave like a pendulum, but close to it. The behavior is similar. So it's good that we study the pendulum and then we move on. There is the deadline for the over one tonight. If you have any question, let me know. Send me an email and, or put something in Canvas, okay? Thank you, guys. There is a quiz today. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. I, I will pose a quiz soon, in a few minutes, yeah? Thank you so much.